Hello, everybody, and welcome to Growing Together, a gardening podcast with me, John Lamb, and Don Kinsler, a lifelong gardener and the North Dakota State University Extension Horticulturist for Cass County. Don, I always trip, trip over that word, horticulturist. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, a, a, a mouthful, isn't it? <laughs> it is. I just always expect there to be an extra L in there, and there's not. Yeah, well, I always, sometimes you hear horticulturalist, okay. but you know, botany, botanist, yep. so horticulture, horticulturist, simpler. Well, Don, I gotta, I gotta, I, I have to apologize to you and, and our listeners in that ever since we've started this podcast, I've been talking about how exciting it is that we're, we're just about done with winter. And every time I say that, we get another storm, and we just had the worst one yet. Well, 13 so, inches 13 in inches. Fargo. 13 inches on March 1st, we woke up to. Uh, it, doesn't, it, doesn't, it doesn't seem right, but, but here we are again. We, we're still going to talk about we're still going to talk about things with hope, things with life. And, and one of the things is that I think is a lot of us went into our garage yesterday and had to dig out shovels, had to dig out snow blowers. We saw those implements of spring and of life, the tools of gardening. And these are things that we should maybe start thinking about despite all the snow we've gotten that we need to start getting ready with some of the stuff, don't we? Well, my garden rake is right beside the shovel. Okay. And the hoe isn't far ab- away from, <laughs> from that, too. And so, yeah, like you said, it does. It gives us hope. And, you know, we know, my gosh, March here, the month is going to change. Yep. Great, uh, great month of change. And so the end of the month, hopefully, knock on wood, is going to be a lot, lot different. But, you know, it's interesting. There are some things that we know we should be doing and we know that eventually we'll need to do when the weather gets better, and we may as well do them now, such as you mentioned tools. You yeah. know, there's some great things that we can do uh, right now. Uh, for example, uh, trying to dig a hole, you know, planting a tree with a shovel, a spade that's dull. I mean, we've got heavy dirt here in the yeah. Red River Valley clay, and it's hard enough to dig a hole with a dull tool. But if you um, if if you sharpen up that spade, it'll just cut so much neater. And also weeding, you know, weeding is probably none of our favorite tasks. But if you keep that hoe nicely sharpened, it'll glide through the soil and it cuts the work in half. Well, so when you're talking about like when we're talking about sharpening up a gardening implement like that, you know, a pretty sizable thing and a pretty heavy piece of metal, you know, so to speak. But like a shovel, we're we're not using like our regular uh, knife sharpening uh, wet stone that we use for our cutlery in our kitchen, are we? We, we got to use something a little bit different. Are you to use like a grinder or what do you use? The thing that I like about getting some of these things sharpened now is we know once we're out in the yard and we've got some dull tools are dragging along, we, we wish that we would have done them now. Yeah. So now is a great time when it's snowy to get some of these things done. So as far as sharpening some of these tools, there's a couple of ways to do it. You can just use a handheld metal file. Okay. You know, put the handle of the tool, the spade or the hoe uh, in a vise if you've got one or kind of just wedge it against something. And then with your metal hand file, that's the way we used to do it when I was a college student. We used to sharpen them just by hand out in the plots. And you can do some really good online searching of how to, sh- how to sharpen tools, lawn and garden tools with a file. And so just by using that and running it along, you can get a pretty decent uh, pretty decent edge on those. Or what I do, I have a, a grinder, you know, electric grinder, and also uh, there's a little bit of an act to it. So there's some really good YouTubes on how to sharpen like a garden hoe using a bench type grinder. And that'll put a really nice edge on it. I can't emphasize that enough, just the, the ease with which a sharp tool will glide through our soil. Well, you're talking about a nice edge. Now, we're not talking again. I, I... I'm comparing apples to oranges by talking about kitchen utensils here. But, you know, like, are you talking about, like, taking a shovel and getting it so fine that you can drag a piece of paper along it and right. cut just clean? Or <laughs> you know, how, or, how, what, is, what is a good edge? How well, would you describe that? We're not going to slice bread with it. <laughs> but, <laughs> but you'll have the type of an edge when you uh, r- r- rub across the edge with your thumb. Uh, you'll think, gosh, that's a nice sharp. You know, it's okay. not it's not going to slice paper. Yeah. But it will or just— Or your thumb. Or your thumb. Right. But it will feel just, man, this is nice. And as you compare first the dull edge that it probably has now and then work at it, and then you'll have a nice, nice edge. And it, it sounds like just maybe one of those kind of nice little extra things, but no, it really does make a difference. So since we're talking about sharpening— uh, 
you know, what about pruners and, and shears? Uh, those are things too that obviously you really want a you want a good fine cutting implement on that. How important is it to and like what 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 could the damage be? Because ultimately, yes, you can use shears and chop away. But just tell us what 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 does that do? What's the, what are the bad things that it can do? Well, there are two things. Of course, one the ease of cut. You don't just go through so much easier when you're doing pruning. But the second thing too is a dull blade will leave a jagged edge. Uh, for example, when you're pruning a shrubbery or or an apple tree. If the pruner is dull, it will leave a jagged edge, and that jagged edge will not seal itself over as well. So it can actually lead to disease and uh, problems such as that or branch dieback. So very, very important. Now, when we're talking about pruners, pruners or other metal tools, they can easily get rusty. You know, maybe last year you did some trimming, didn't clean them up and put them away, and now they've got a little rust on. So it's important with steel wool or even sandpaper to rub off any little dust or uh, rust particles that are starting to form. And also oil, good time to squirt some oil, um, WD-40 or anything like that even. That'll help coat the metal blades so that then they'll have less rust and uh, it'll lubricate them at the same time. So very important to get any rust off uh, of the tools that may have accumulated over winter. Now, when you're, when you're uh, with pruners, when you sharpen those, are you using the same kind of things there? Are you using a file or are you using a, you know, like you said, a, a, a grinder or what are you using for yep. that? Or metal file works really quite nicely. Metal hand file uh, or a grinder that can work to a grinding type wheel. Now, we mentioned some of the tools that have wooden handles, such yeah. as a uh, spade or shovel. Um, now, it's interesting. Some people call those spades. Right. Uh, I grew up calling them a shovel. Uh, a spade was a spading fork. Oh. Uh, you know, such as you dig potatoes or carrots with, you know, a fork. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, so anyway, different terminology, but okay. whether you call it a shovel or a spade or a spading fork or a garden hoe, uh, typically all have wooden handles. Okay. And over time, those wooden handles can get uh, kind of weathered and they can start to splinter. And that's when you get lots of slivers on your hands or blisters. But there's a good way to treat those wooden handles. And that's an old time remedy that I've used a long, long time. And that's uh, linseed oil and turpentine. And you can buy both those at a hardware store or paint supply stores, easy to come by. So a mixture of equal parts linseed oil and turpentine. Boy, and it even smells good. It's got kind of a, a wood-type aroma, just a really nice uh, uh, fragrance to it. But anyway, you use that, uh, just dip a cloth into it, and work that into the wooden handles. It helps them last longer. The wooden handles won't crack, and they'll last a lot longer. Now, I'm a big fan of old tools, because some of these old garden tools have heavy metal, and they're just, uh, you know, they're just kind of awesome. Uh, you know what I mean? They're, yeah. They're, they're structurally good. Well, they've lasted this long. Uh, yeah, exactly. And so uh, the best garden hoe that I have was one I actually that was around when I was a boy, and I inherited it. But to keep the wooden handle really, really nice, just this mixture of linseed oil and turpentine does a really good job. I wish uh, I wish I would have pulled out are they talking about this now? You remember Dorothy Collins? The oh, yes. I grew up Garden reading Collins. Dorothy Collins. She wrote the Forum Garden column for 50 years, was it? Close yeah. to it? Yeah. And I grew up reading Dorothy Collins. There was a period here at the Forum where I was the I was, I was her editor. I was the editor of that section for a while. And I remember one time reading her column, you know, kind of proofing it. And it was a discussion that she had with her gardening friends about what her favorite gardening tool was. What was and it? I can't remember. I wish I would have pulled it up. Do you Do you have a favorite, though, of yours? I do. Two, two of them. Okay. Okay. One is a garden hoe. And okay. like I mentioned, uh, I inherited one of those. And that is a fairly thick, substantial hoe that I use for uh, making the furrows in which you plant seeds. But I, I also purchased a hoe, a weeding type hoe. Now, a weeding type hoe is very narrow. The metal part, uh, the blade part, is very, very narrow, so it will glide through soil. Now, it was expensive, and, but I expect that uh, hoe to last all of my lifetime and, and the kids. That is a good weeding hoe. Uh, but now, the other one's going to sound kind of funny. Okay, so... Um, uh, another one favorite is a kitchen 
a butter type knife. Yep. You know what I mean? Just a bread and butter table type knife. Yep. Uh, because what I use that for, and I always wash it before I put it back in the silverware drawer. But <laughs> what I use that for is weeding in a ro- within the rows of vegetables or around flowers. Because, for example, weeding a row of carrots, uh, the weeds come up... Um, probably even more substantially than the carrots do. And you've got to get down within that row and pull some by hand. They don't always pull, but a knife, a table knife, will kind of slice right down through the weeds. You can do a precision weeding with a table type knife. And so it sounds funny, but that's one of my favorite garden tools as well. And our my our neighbor growing up, he was... Oh, he was at least in his 80s when I was born. His name was Fred Kurlick, and he came over from, I think he came over from Ukraine. And, um, but I remember he had this great garden out back. His backyard was, you know, it was, it was, most of it was, was like, it was a vegetable garden. And I remember there always being a butter knife on the bricks around it, like lying, lying right there, just kind of like at the ready. And that was his, that was one of his gardening implements. Sure. Uh, Yeah. And I, actually, I do leave that one out in the garage. I, I don't put it back in the silverware <laughs> drawer after after use. So I dinner actually guests do, I, don't need I to worry. A, exactly. I do have a dedicated table knife. Okay. <laughs> um, you know, we were talking a little bit about uh, sharpening, especially pruners, and I wanted to see... Um, for especially handheld pruners like Felco's, things like that, a lot of those they'll actually come apart, won't they? They they will they'll they'll come into two so that you can take them apart for easier cleaning, right? Right, and the blade does come off uh, on those so for easier sharpening. And um, the the wonderful thing about pruning tools is that uh, they can last a long time. But the, here's where. It pays to invest in the good stuff. So really the cheaper, lower-end uh, pruning shears really don't last as well. And the frustrating thing is they don't cut as well. So you, you absolutely do get what you pay for in some of those. Now, the handheld pruning shears are great for cutting about pencil-sized twigs, like on shrubbery, etc. And then you usually need the long-handled lopper-type pruning shears for uh, about one inch or so diameter branches but 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 again it really does pay to invest in the high quality and they're going to last plus it just makes the job so much easier i know you know you you talked about earlier with one of your hoes that it was an investment you know uh i've found that uh looking at um estate sales and 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 yard sales garage sales being able to pick up some some good cheap tools that way has been a pretty effective uh effective thing to look for you know even Pots for plants. Good way to good way to find stuff like that. That's, right, because that some be some of those estate sales, uh, you can find gardening tools from people that were heavy duty yep. heavy duty gardeners. Yeah, and so you, you can find the, the fairly good tools at a fairly economical price. That's always a kind of a nice find, isn't it? It is. You know, and most of those, even though they maybe look uh, they maybe don't look the prettiest, but some of that metal will sharpen up just fine, and then treat the wood handle, and you're good. How about something else that you know we think of as the summer, and then we kind of have to pull inside. And it's, I guess it is a tool, but garden hoses, you know, uh, I, I confess to having left my hose out one year and, uh, it, it kind of blew out the next summer. What do you do to, how, how do you winterize garden hoses? And then what should we be doing with them now? And of course, there's nothing worse than a garden hose that leaks, you know, yep. right up there by your handle where, yes, you're, yes. where you've got the nozzle turned turn on the garden hose and then it's dripping all the way down or just your spraying arm. spraying everywhere. <laughs> yeah. Or right, a, a leak. And so what I like to do is keep a couple of items on hand so that once we hook up our garden hose, you're kind of ready to go. Uh, one of those uh, is a supply of rubber or vinyl hose washers so that you can slip those in so a a washer that fits right inside the the end there of the hose uh oftentimes they'll get dry down kind of cracked and then that's when the leaks happen so you can just pry out the old washer put in a new one and if you have a little supply of those then you're good to go and it's kind of a one size fits all on the standard garden uh, hose. Then also, I keep a couple of repair kits. You can buy those at uh, hardware stores, uh, hose mending kits. And so when you've got that leak that you notice, sometimes the rest of the hose is perfectly good, but you can just cut at that leaky spot of the you know where it's shooting out a little stream. Just cut at that point, and there are hose mending type things that will join it back together again. So you can repair a hose. Uh, and 
Boy, hoses. That's where it also pays to buy the good stuff. That's true. I, because, I uh, you know, it never fails. You'll pull out 100 feet of hose, and it kinks way back by the water spigot. Yep. You know, never right within easy reach. Right. Uh, but anyway, the better type garden hoses uh, don't kink as easily. What do you think about, have you seen these? Uh, we have we have one that's for a smaller space. We've got... Uh, two faucets uh, on the outside of the house. And we've got one that reaches a smaller area. We use a, a metal hose that's, um, I guess, kind of hard to explain that, but you know, it's got little little sections. So it always, it doesn't roll up quite as well as the, uh, as the, as the old rubber hose, but have, have you, have you any experience with those? No. And sometimes we're going to do some remotes this, uh, this summertime. So yeah, I want to come and you. see what that I'll hose is. You. The other thing. Yeah. I'd be curious to see what that is. Uh, a metal hose. Yeah. It's just kind of metal I've seen exterior. Metal, metal tubing, but I'm not sure I've seen yeah. a metal hose. The other thing that's kind of interesting, uh, and I've never tried one, are these pocket hoses. You know, the type that, you know, just scrunch up totally, yes. you know, as seen on TV. Yes. You know, that scrunch up totally and you can stick in your pocket and then somehow it balloons out. I'm curious if those work well. Yeah, that, that just it just kind of the nature of the as seen on TV makes me a little dubious. <laughs> but I don't know, and, you know, and again, like you said, like if you 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 want to buy quality, uh, and you want it's going to be an investment that you hope will last for years. Uh, I I tend to go with I tend to I tend to go with try to find either a name brand or that is something that I'll do a review on and and try to find something that that works good for there. Yeah, exactly. Because, you know, gardening is a, is a good hobby, good pastime, and and you want things to go smoothly. So, yeah, it pays to have equipment uh, that works well for you. When you were talking about washers, putting washers in, do you put them on, on both ends of the hose? And do you do this every every season? The, uh, the uh, up in the, anywhere that has the female uh, coupling, okay. uh, where it has a washer in inside that female coupling, I, I don't always replace them because sometimes they're okay, yep. uh, but I always keep that supply on hand so that if, if uh, I get that leak when you join up the two, uh, you know, when you join up kind of a little watering wand to the end, into the female end, uh, then if it's leaking, then I also replace. So since we're... But it's hard to run to a hardware store every time, you know, you get something like that. So it's yeah. just, uh, nice to have a couple dollars worth on the shelf. And we really should also, it's it's not too early to really start working on the lawnmower, is it? Uh, oh, or ab- absolutely. It. Yeah. You know, because it's one of those things when the when spring hits and the snow is gone and the grass starts to green up, of course, then it's going to be fun to smell that freshly cut grass again. Yep. But we may as well get the lawnmower blade sharpened now because that makes a big, big difference. And then once lawn mowing season starts, we won't have to pause and sharpen it. And they are not really that difficult to sharpen. You know, you can take them into a, a hardware store that sharpens lawnmower blades. You can do that. Or if it's a really bad blade, you can just buy a new one. But Or you can sharpen it yourself. I take the lawnmower blade off and use either a metal file or the sharpening uh, wheel. That I mentioned, the yep. grinding type wheel. They aren't uh, overly difficult to get a decent edge on, nice sharp edge. And there, there's a couple of important reasons for having a good sharp lawnmower blade. Uh, first of all, it makes the lawn look better because as you're looking out over that newly mown lawn, if if it's a jagged edge, it's going to have more of a grayish appearance. But if it's got a fresh, nice, if each blade has been crisply cut, the entire lawn will look nice. Golf courses sharpen their blades daily, at least. Uh, It's that important. But there's another key factor, too. And that is, if the lawnmower blade is dull, it will give a jagged edge to the each grass blade. And that jagged edge will lose moisture quicker than a nice, crisp cut. So that means the grass plants will lose moisture quicker and the grass will dry out quicker. And so it keeps the lawn healthier by giving it a good crisp cut with a very sharp blade. You know, since you're taking the the lawnmower blade off, I wonder, do you clean out on the inside of the the lawnmower there? Like, I'm not sure what that would be, but the 
on between the well, where the long yeah, where the blade I'm goes not sure around. What you call and, the, and it, you know, it's you know the innards. The innards, yeah. But, but we're not getting into the engine work. Well, I'll, I'll leave right, the engine but. work to professionals. <laughs> but um, you know, some, especially if you mow the lawn after it's been a little wet, you'll notice it really cakes up in there, right? And that can really be that can really be a problem. Um, do you do you go in there at all? Do you clean off your? your and then once, well, uh, let me say I should. How's okay. that? I should. We recommend I, this. Yeah, <laughs> I, rec- I fully recommend it. Uh, you know, it's interesting when that builds up underneath and then it kind of gets a little rust starting or something, then the grass doesn't shoot out as yeah. cleanly. And so it is important to keep that inside clean. I will admit my lawnmower is probably at least 15 years old. It still runs good. But the inside underneath there isn't nice and bright and shiny anymore. Yeah. And some of that could be because I wasn't always religious about cleaning that inside out. Yeah. Well, that's that could be bright and shiny on the something that you hope nobody ever needs to see except for you and your, <laughs> but it, it your does, maintenance But it does work a lot smoother if, you know, it shoots it out better. Or um, mulches. You, you do not find as many lawnmowers that have that discharge shoot. Yeah. I went to buy a lawnmower in the towards the end of fall because mine was kind of uh, playing out a little bit. Um, I didn't actually end up buying one. I just fixed my old one. But anyway, I couldn't find a, a, you know, a a walk behind push mower uh, that had a discharge chute. Uh, They've gone to the recycling. And that's good, you know, because the recycling mowers send all the clippings down into the grass. And that's good. It's beneficial. But sometimes if the lawn gets away from you just a little bit, it's hard to mulch all that back down in. So I like the I like to be able to have a discharge shoot that if it gets away from me a little, I can still shoot that outward and then go over it a couple of times. See, I, I don't beg our grass at all. Yeah. I return, uh, and it'll be fun. Sometime we can talk about all that too as we get into lawn mowing season. But there's so much good benefit to what you're cutting off, it's going to turn into good nutrients. So you may as well mulch it down in instead of begging it uh, and hauling it off. You know, the other thing that we see a lot, I see in my garage, it's actually been, I've seen it there, uh, you know, a lot. And every time I do, I I should do something with that, is I've got a box of old, let's say, the pesticides and the all the different things, the, the weed be gone and all those things that I got to wonder now, you know, is, you know, here in the spring. How many of those should I have just thrown away? How many of them, like, what's what's the shelf life and how do you how do you take care of this stuff? Well, most of us keep a lot of these products out in the garage because it's handy. You know, it's where we're working with them all summer long, including the grass seed that we maybe sprinkle on in the spring of the year to repair some patches. And then it's easy just to put it back in the garage, you know, in case you need to repair a little more. And so all of a sudden then fall hits and uh, there it stays for the winter time. The freezing actually does not bother grass seed. But it's sat in the garage all summer long, and that heat and the humidity, that is bad. Uh, So grass seed over time diminishes in its ability to germinate. So if it's been stored where it's hot and humid, uh, the best storage would be in a refrigerator. But uh, I think very few of us take our grass seed and move it into the refrigerator. Right. So... Uh, we can pretty much uh, be certain that it's going to be reduced in germination. So whatever the label says, you might want to put it on twice as thick. Um, If the grass seed has been out in your garage for more than a couple of seasons, it probably isn't very good. Okay. Uh, Even at best uh, best conditions, grass seed probably isn't going to last more than about three years. How about fertilizer? And fertilizer, as long as it's been kept uh, dry... It hasn't gotten all wet and caked. Uh, it'll be fine. The freezing won't hurt. Won't hurt dry fertilizer. Liquid fertilizer, it could. Uh, liquid fertilizer, uh, if it freezes, it could bust the bottle. If it was kind of a water-based liquid fertilizer, but dry fertilizers are probably going to be okay. Uh, even if they did get a little humid and caked, you can usually just break that up and they're going to be fine. So freezing does not affect, uh, adversely affect um, lawn type fertilizers or other granular types. How about things like the, the weed control, you know, uh, weed be gone or ortho, all those different things. Um, are they, are they affected by freeze too? 
Well, it's it's so handy to keep those things in the garage, close to where you're going to be using them. Yeah. Okay. And then, as I mentioned, fall hits, uh, and all of a sudden we got freezing outside. We don't always think to move some of these products, and some of these products can be ruined by freezing. And so now is a good time to check them because uh, go out to the garage shelf before they thaw back out. Uh, and if they're frozen now, and when they say they, uh, any insect killers, uh, weed weed killers, herbicides, uh, fungicides for pre- preventing diseases, any of those products that right now are frozen in the bottle uh, likely are not going to be any good. Okay. Once they freeze like that solid, there are a few oil-based products or herbicides that are probably going to be okay because the oil in them prevents freezing. But as a rule of thumb, if most of these products froze, liquid products froze, they're not going to be good. And when we are applying some of these products, we want them to be effective. So check now and uh, see if they've been frozen. Uh, I'd probably dispose of them. And when I say dispose of them, we're not supposed to if you thaw them out and dump them the, down the drain. That, that, that's not that's good. That's certainly bad, yeah. <laughs> and, and so the best is to take them to one of the spots that takes hazardous waste. In Fargo, up near the landfill, there's a special site where you can just drop things like that off, you know, paints and different type things. So that's a better spot for these herbicides or pesticides. Plus you'll get a head step on, you get a, you get a head start on your spring cleaning that way, won't you? Yeah, exactly. And you see, the thing is, is once we get warm weather and if those products thaw back out, you'll probably look at them and they'll be liquid, uh, but you don't know if they've lost their effectiveness or not. Uh, even if you do bring these products indoors, and keep them from freezing, how long do some of these products stay effective? And most have a shelf life of around three years. So if you've had a bottle of malathion or seven or other insect sprays, uh, but if it's getting older than about three years, it's probably not going to be as effective. Uh, I didn't mention garden dusts. You know, sometimes the insecticides, we might have oh, garden sure. dusts, yeah. the powders. And freezing does not really harm those. So if you've got a bag of garden insecticide dust, that's probably still okay. Fertilizers, uh, is that something that we should also be bringing to hazardous waste or can that just go in the garbage? I have, well, uh, uh, well, not liquid fertilizers, but, you know, like uh, yeah, lawn fertilizers, things like yeah, that. Yeah, lawn fertilizers, if they're absolutely all caked up uh, and things to where you just can't use or if they're them just it, old, anymore. Like, with the, say they're yeah, if they're just old, old um, then, yeah, hazardous waste is probably the better Uh, a better uh, spot to take any of those type of products. So, Don, we were talking about, you know, uh, we're talking about lawn work, but then also because we just got dumped with 13 inches of snow, we've been moving snow and you found, you found an unexpected guest while moving snow? Well, when I was blowing snow alongside our driveway, I saw something that I haven't seen before. And I've never seen it before. So as I was blowing snow right on the edge of my driveway, all of a sudden I uncovered a big fat vole. <laughs> and it, it was... It was fat, healthy. <laughs> now, um, a vole, and we're not, we're not, we're not judging or shaming. Or there's, a, <laughs> there's no body shaming here. Uh, but yeah, this was a well-fed. This, it, this had been treating. It itself. was. And now, okay, I, I've never seen when I've snow blowed. I've never uncovered a vole. Now, uh, voles are a uh, little small. They're a rodent. Uh, they're a very short-tailed field mouse. They're not the type of mice that come in the house. They're a dark brown, grayish brown, and they're slow moving. Um, Now, I see them in the summer or in the fall when I'm mowing lawn. You'll sometimes uh, see them slowly going in in the lawn. And when I say they're slow, you can can catch them by foot. Um, And I don't run that fast. (laughs) Uh, So anyway, I'm blowing snow, and they're right... Under, I uncovered this big vole. And now that, that alarms me. Okay. And so, well, that vole is in a better place now. Right. Um, and so I continue on and I uncover another one equally as healthy. And so what that's telling me is we're going to have vole problems. Now, for anybody that has experienced vole problems, and they're quite common, uh, you see the damage when the snow all disappears 
And after it melts, your lawn is left with a bunch of surface channels, these meandering, this kind of maze of little channels. And that's where the voles have worked all winter under the snow, and they've been feeding on the surface of the grass. And um, they'll sometimes also find trees, young trees, and they'll girdle the bark around those. So they cause a lot, a lot of damage. And so now I am thinking that we might have a very serious vole problem once the snow disappears. And here's the reason. We got a very wet, heavy snow in December quite early, and the ground wasn't overly frozen yet. Uh, There was a fair amount of warmth in the ground yet. Then we get this wet, heavy snow, and then just snow on top of snow on top of snow. So those voles have had a good spot to live all winter. And I'm really afraid when the snow disappears, our lawns are going to be left with all these surface channels. Now, uh, so oftentimes as they're eating the grass crown, they leave all this brown fluff, and sometimes they use it for nesting also. But uh, in many cases, the lawns will recover if they didn't chew down far enough into the grass plant. If they left enough of it to come back, lawns will come back, but you've got all this mess to rake off. So sometimes the lawn will be fine, but of course the trees that it girdles, uh, they usually do not come back. So uh, we won't really know the extent of the damage until uh, the snow is all gone. Then I'll be real curious. Now, of course, not every lawn is affected by voles, but I see a lot of it in our urban areas. When you talk about tree girdle, so are we, and because the the voles are, you know, the size of a mouse, you know, how high up on a tree will they go? Or is it really right around the surface where the ground meets? Right around the surface, yeah. Okay. They, they don't seem to climb up like a house mouse would. Uh, They stay pretty much right at ground level. And um, also, let's see, the the other thing I should mention is um, in uh, in the summertime when you see them mowing, you know, you'll see them. Okay, so what else do they do during the summertime? They seem to be hiding in places and occasionally you'll see them, but it's really in the wintertime when they have clear cover you know, underneath the cover, they've got clear sailing without a lot of predators. See, hawks and owls are their main predators, and but they can't find them under the snow like that in most cases. So they've got clear sailing to do their damage. But in the fall of the year, if a person suspects you're going to have full damage, such as if you've seen them active in the summertime, uh, we can put down traps baited with peanut butter or peanuts. Uh, I like uh, rodent poison, uh, but we want to make sure that pets and kids don't get it yeah, the poison. It's so it it's a good um, good method to use a piece of PVC pipe. Okay. And cut a oh, maybe eighteen inch or two feet of that, and then put the rodent poison inside that. Uh, these voles like to go into little tunnels. And so by doing that, you keep the poison inside. And you can put those kind of around the perimeter of your area, especially in the fall before you start getting the snow. The damage that they do in the summertime doesn't seem to be as great. Uh, They've got, you know, more other things to eat. So are they, do they burrow? Do they go underground? Or are they really just a surface kind of animal? I mean, Mm. understanding that they're underneath the snow. Sure, very much at the surface. Okay. Uh, In the vegetable garden, they will eat the shoulders of carrots, you know, where the green top meets the carrot root. Right up at the shoulder, they'll eat those uh, beets, you know, a table beet. They'll uh, eat the shoulders of those, uh, potatoes. So they, they will work in these top, you know, inch or two of, of soil. So they'll go after potatoes. And so oftentimes when people dig potatoes, they'll find potatoes half eaten also. So they're, they're very destructive. I don't, I don't want to use this word, but is it like an infestation? I mean, do you, will there, will there be, you found two yesterday or when, when you were snow blowing, um, are you, you're expecting more. I mean, how many more out there? Yeah, if I found two uh, like that, then I'm suspecting there's lots. The other thing that's scary about voles, they do run in cycles, population cycles. Um, the scary thing about voles, if you do a little research, is a, a vole can have hundreds of little voles each year. And uh, a vole only has to be, I think, about 30 days old before it can start having more voles. Wow. So the population can explode rapidly. Ooh. 
So I, it's, it's going to be interesting. We won't know for sure until the snow melts. But uh, like I say, I've never, in snow blowing for the last uh, 40 years, I, I've never found voles under where I've been snow blowing. And I wasn't going anywhere. I wasn't going out onto the lawn. I was just going alongside the driveway. You know, you're talking about it's natural, natural predators, uh, owls and hawks. And I think one of the things, uh, the big ones is foxes. And, and I'm not, in, I hope people don't have foxes in their yards. Uh, but when you see foxes, especially like on the nature shows, when they are perched on top of a snowbank and they kind of leap straight up in the air and dive down into the, into the into the snowbank, uh, what I understand a lot of times that they're they know that a vole is under there and they're they're diving for. Yeah, isn't that amazing how they? I, I suppose they hear it. Yeah, yeah, hear it and probably smell it. I guess. Yeah, isn't that amazing? It. Yeah, and through you know through. So inches now, and inches if of I snow. see an eagle or hawk diving on our inner yard, yeah, uh, that's a good thing. Yeah, we're okay with that. Yeah. So worst case situation, you've discovered that you have voles. The snow is gone. You see all these the the marks of the voles out in your in your lawn. Um, what do you do? Is it is it just something? And, and you, we talked about putting out traps, but but what do you do for the lawn? Do you is that an area where you go back and reseed? Yeah, the vole dam is usually accompanied by a lot of loose grass too that they've chewed off. So the first thing would be to rake it all off, and a person should wait kind of to rake it off until it has gotten dry enough and firm enough to do that. So you aren't ripping up any grass. So wait until the surface is dry a little bit, then give it a really good raking, and then kind of assess if the voles have chewed down so where you see some bare dirt actually then we do need to reseed uh, and the time to reseed would be in early May uh, all, but if you still see kind of little nubbins if it didn't go right down to the dirt oftentimes the grass will come from that little crown the spot between the grass blade and the roots that crown where the new growth will come if that's still intact then you're good but fertilizer will help greatly now the best time to fertilize in may is to delay a little bit down closer towards the uh, the end of may memorial day or so is better give the grass a little chance to start growth and then give it the nutrition it needs so fertilizing uh, a vole damaged lawn is a really really good step that'll help encourage both root growth and the new top growth now this may be a fact that i learned from you reading over the years but one good rule of thumb i always heard for when it's time to go out and rake in your yard not to do it too early is that if you can kneel down in your yard and you get up and you really shouldn't have your knees shouldn't be wet your your jeans shouldn't be wet right that is that is true that is probably one of the surest signs of your lawn being ready is just to kneel on it and if your knees stay dry you're good to go hopefully we'll get there soon <laughs> yeah i hope so as well So, Don, we're always asking people or, or encouraging people if they have questions to to write us, uh, to write in. And one question I had for you is we've talked about houseplants on the show, and you pointed out that there's a Facebook group. I think it's called Fargo House Plants. And so I joined. I became a member, and it's been fun to look at that and see everybody's houseplants. There Isn't really like 5,000 awesome. members? Oh, about? yeah. Isn't it up to, I think... Yeah, 1,001 yeah. now after yeah. I joined. 5,001. Oh, 5,001, yes. yeah. But, uh, you know, it is, it's really remarkable and it's really beautiful to see all this, all this color, all this greenery, big, healthy plants. I've also seen some people on there uh, who, are, who are either selling plants or, or um, uh, clippings. Uh, what, what, do, what do you recommend? If you're going to buy a plant uh, from somebody... What, what, what should you look for, whether it's the plant or the, or the clipping? The first thing that I would look for is to be sure that it's insect-free. Okay. Uh, and, of course, sometimes if someone's selling it over Facebook, uh, you aren't always able to look at the parent plant from which it came. You know, if it was just a cutting that, that you're purchasing or that they're giving to you, or whether it's a little potted plant that came off of one of their mother plants, uh, very important to make sure that insects aren't being transmitted that way. And, of course, that's maybe one uh, advantage of buying from a garden center or houseplant store is that you're able to examine the plant 
Uh, well, and, um, you know, it's fun to get plants from other people too, but insect transmission is probably the number one thing to be cautious of. Well, and with house plants, because most of them we talked about are, are grown in tropical locations. It's not like people are necessarily growing new ones here. So it can be kind of an economical way of doing it to, to get from to get one from somebody else, isn't it? Again, especially some fairly rare plants. Uh, we had mentioned before that plant breeders have been really, really busy. There are some really unique uh, types of house plants that have been developed, and uh, they they sometimes aren't readily available other places. So uh, getting starts from a friend, cuttings and rooting them is a good way to get new plants. Yeah. And I, I correct myself. Uh, I said clippings earlier. And when you're talking about gardening, clippings and cuttings well, okay. are, but they are very different uh, things. Uh, yeah. Aren't clippings, they? cuttings, uh, but that, that works. Yeah. You know, the old we'll term is cuttings. slips. Snips. Taking a slip. Oh, slip. A slip. Okay. Yep. And <laughs> I, I think I've told this before, but I always get a kick out of it is, you know, when I was a young boy, uh, my mom and grandmother loved plants. And when I heard my mom say uh, that grandma had taken a slip, I thought she'd maybe fallen on the ice. And but a slip was taking a cutting from a house plant. <laughs> so, Don, do you have anything coming up? Do you have any webinars coming up? On Wednesday, March eighth, I'm doing a webinar on pruning. Uh, discussing everything from pruning apple trees to trimming your landscape shrubs. And then on Wednesday, March 15th, a webinar on just getting everything ready for spring. Uh, your lawns, perennial flowers, your apple trees, uh, vegetable garden, just getting everything ready for spring. So March 8th and March 15th. And you can uh, register for those by just doing an online search, NDSU Cass County Extension, NDSU Cass County Extension. That'll take you to our page and you'll see those events for registration. And always, if people have any questions, where can they reach you? Yeah, feel free to email me and send photos. You know, whether it's houseplant, tree, shrub, anything, you know, feel free to send some photos. That's always very helpful. And you can email me at donald.kinsler. I'll spell that. Donald.kinsler, K-I-N-Z-L-E-R, at ndsu.edu. And that's going to do it for Growing Together, a gardening podcast. I'm John Lamb. Don Kinsler. And we'll talk to you again soon. Love staying informed? Subscribe now and get unlimited access to local news, weather, and sports for just 99 cents a month for your first three months at inform.news. Join. Read every story, listen to every podcast, and download the apps that keep you informed and on the go 24 hours a day. So head to inform.news slash join right now to subscribe. What are you waiting for? Get three months of local news for just 99 cents a month at inform.news slash join.